Good morning, good afternoon, good night. Thanks for joining us on today's podcast of Conversation and Coffee with your co-host Gary Senna and I am Danny Vicent. Thank you for listening whenever, wherever, and however you are joining us. Conversations and Coffee is the place where we share a cup of coffee and allow our curiosity to sit in the driver's seat and explore topics in your industry. Everything from technology to leadership to innovation and so much more. So grab your favorite cup of coffee, sit back, laugh with us while we dive into the topics keeping you up at night. Well, Danny, welcome to welcome everybody to another podcast episode of Conversations and Coffee. We're so excited this is the fifth. Danny, we have done five in a financial service series. Can you believe that? We absolutely have, and we've, we've learned quite a bit. And I see a couple of familiar faces, or I guess one familiar face on this on this one, and, and one new face. So we've got, again, the world famous Al Slimecki. He doesn't like me calling him world famous, but we all know the truth. And we have uh, somebody, Gary, I don't know if you know this, but superstar, collegiate athlete, world-renowned diver, now financial services expert on the call in, in Heidi. And I will let you both uh, introduce yourself at the moment. I said I suddenly feel so inferior. Um, but you know, as a uh, I'm getting to be a, a regular, I guess. So as long as you guys have a world class podcast, maybe there's a chance to be uh, to be known around the world a little bit more. But uh, I'm Al Slameka. I'm the global financial services business development manager uh, within Cisco's Industry Solutions Group. Great to have you back, Al. How about you, Heidi? And I, I'm excited to be officially in front of the camera this time. So my name is Heidi Serdic. I am the Global Financial Services Marketing Lead on the Global Industries Marketing Team here at Cisco. So worked with all you gentlemen a lot, but this is my first time actually in front of the camera instead of just behind helping with the planning. So happy to be here. Very cool. Well, thanks for joining us. So as Gary said, this is the fifth one in our, in our financial services deep dive series, if you will. And we have heard a number of different topics. Uh, and, and I guess my very first question is for you, you two, as you've listened to this, and, and really, uh, uh, you know, as we were talking off camera, this is kind of a question for us all. What were your takeaways? What were your key takeaways or maybe some surprises uh, that came out of this series that, that really struck with you? Heidi, do you want to start? Sure. So I think that overall, nothing super surprising. Um, but what I viewed this series as was a great way to kind of encapsulate everything that's happened in the past 12 months and almost break it down into each specific part of the industry that got affected. So obviously the last 12 months, huge digital transformation that's hit financial services. And so in making this podcast series five different episodes long, we were able to talk, you know, specifically into what, how has this affected the security aspect of things? How has this affected the cloud, the process automation? So I think that's been a really great way to kind of compartmentalize mentally what's happened and how financial institutions can best respond to it. Um, and my key takeaway from everything that all the experts talked about was really how do we make every experience that a customer is having with a financial institution feel like you are at that bank's headquarters. So from the employee perspective, they need to have the very best internet connection, the best security mechanisms in place, the best opportunity to collaborate with their colleagues. And then from the customer perspective, it needs to be personalized, streamlined, super easy as if you were talking to someone right across the desk rather than maybe it working on your app while you're walking outside or sitting at your couch at home on your laptop. So that was kind of the takeaway for me was how to make it the absolute best experience as if you were in their headquarters, no matter where you're at. And I think that the, the folks you guys had on had a great perspective in terms of talking through how it's possible to make an interaction like that feel so high class, no matter where you might be. Yeah, I, I think Heidi nailed it. I think, you know, when we talked about putting the series together and we thought about those sp specific topics around looking at customer experience and the customer journey and looking at, you know, the aspects of operational risk and then also the aspects of, you know, the move to the cloud. We, I think we all had an understanding, right, that there was some you know, interrelation between those different architectures, if you will, right, and Cisco speak. And then when you heard everybody, you know, um, 
talk about what's going on and the aspects of the detail inside each of those, you know, for me, it, 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 if it will reinforce the importance that as financial institutions are trying to achieve this goal Heidi uh, talked about, that they really do have to do that cross-functionally, cross-organizationally. And I think at the start, in the first podcast, we talked about now is the time to be bold. And I think, you know, we're seeing mm -hmm. that. Um, and, uh, you know, my hope is that, uh, you know, even as we're coming now out through, you know, into 2021 and, and hopefully now, you know, through the course of the year, we'll start to see, you know, the, uh, the growth that we hope to see from an economic perspective, right, and the rebound of global economies, that that energy just continues, right? Because they are challenges. And I, I think maybe the one thing that folks would recognize from listening to this um, is all this acceleration is fantastic, right? But it's we're still talking about um, a few years worth of transformation that has to go on you know, to get to this place. You know, but I would ask you guys, you're the ones that actually talked uh, to everybody and um, uh, if you had any, you know, particular views, I know Danny, you've got a banking background, and and Gary, you, yeah. know, you probably have a bank account. So. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm pretty sure that I do. <laughs> I I think Al, the thing, and that to me, that's a great question. The thing that really stunned me on all of the podcasts, and you mentioned the word, you were mentioned the word detail, was that the the double and the triple and the quadruple clicking down for an industry that was forced to quickly adapt and quickly change that historically has moved a lot slower to, to me is it's just been it's been a fascinating thing to observe and then to look at where it's going to be trending 5 10 15 years from now to, to me I, I i was stunned at not only the acceleration acceleration of the pace that it had to go at but also the level of details when you get into hybrid cloud, when you get into data center discussions and, and all those things. And in, and in our, you know, you're in my retirement in a couple of years, we look forward to that. Yeah, 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 <laughs> we, we do. Thanks. You know, I think the thing that, that stood out the most to me um, is I think we all anticipated or, or saw in the beginning an accelerated approach to going digital within financial services. When the pandemic first hit, they pushed on the gas and brought three years worth of digitization to the forefront. Um, and you kind of touched on it now. What I noticed was, I think there was an opportunity that opened up there. There was a lens into what that increased speed brought. Um, and then to your point, all of a sudden it's like, okay, well now there's still another three or four years of digitization to pull us up to where we actually want to be. And, and they saw that opportunity in, in front of them. And I don't know that uh, we're going to see a slowdown in that acceleration. So I'm not sensing that. I, I sense like they saw the opportunity and now they're going to go full bore uh, on that three year, four year, five year plan, however long that takes. I think that stood out the most to me. Um, yeah. You know, the, the, other, the other question I had as, as we're, we're talking about this is, you know, when we look at these, this podcast series, you could almost take each one as a standalone. You know, you could take the cloud discussion or the regulation and security and risk compliance one or, or the automation and, and you look at them all and you say, okay, but they do tie in together. And, and I guess this question, this question comes to you guys is, is how do we tie that all in together? What is that overarching story that if somebody's listening to this, they say, okay, ah, there's the moment why I want to listen to all these. Mm. Well, I, you know, I think that's a really good question because um, it's hard to think um, through the different connections, because even if you think about the customer journey, it's not this linear, you know, journey like like Brad Tyson was saying when we talked to him about uh, customer experience. And you know, our customers today are saying, you know, we're not looking at our our customers from a persona perspective anymore. We're looking at them from an individual perspective, and that journey may start here, jump here, go over here, go there. And so even when we talk about the notion of journey orchestration, what we're really talking about is kind of a series of events. And so fortunately, I think as we think about how to enable that, the one word that comes to mind is you need great flexibility, right? So as you think about the underlying elements of what you need from a security perspective, right? You've got to be able to be flexible across any of those conversations and ensure they are secure. 
you have to you know make sure that the the place in which those conversations are happening folks home is delivering a great experience and uh you know you also need to to make sure that um you know if you're if you're pulling in information from the cloud for any of these conversations or sharing information or working in teams right that um that you have the underlying you know infrastructure there right to support that so i would say it's much like you know if you were going to build a house with the notion of eventually i'm going to add on to the house right you you look at the foundation of it and you look at the way that you're building it and you say i need to build this in a flexible way it's just that what we're talking about is you know considerably more you know involved in building a house you know and and a, and a great view into that is is all the remote work now all right Heidi, what was what about your response to the same question Yes. So I think that Al, what you said, I completely agree that it's all about every element has to come together to build this strong house and there does have to be a lot more flexibility. And I think that the reason for that flexibility, actually, Gary, I think you really explained it well in the last podcast. And you said that the shift is now from financial institutions driving the interaction to customers driving it. So now the customers are really the ones in the driver's seat. And so I like how you stated that last time. Um, and I know even at the beginning of 2020, I was reading research on what was to come that year. And that already had said that two thirds of all companies right now are competing primarily on the basis of customer experience. And I have to guess that that statistic has gone even more in that direction, that it's all about the customers driving the interaction. And that's why there are all these variables that the financial institutions have to be that much more flexible and that much more agile when they're putting together their networks. No, it's a, it's a great point. One of the things that I learned, and I have kind of a, a fascinating story about it, was just the demographics of, of the banking industry changing. I know we talked about did, did COVID really you know, escalate to speed? Well, of course it did. But speed change was already occurring. And, and I laughed because over the weekend I had a, a, a conversation with a, with a banker who is, you know, well into his 70s. And we were, I was just talking to him about Cisco's offerings and all this kind of stuff. And, and I, I said the word, you know, you know, work from home. And he, he stopped me immediately, got all animated. He said, Gary, first of all, there is no such thing as working from home. You think these people are working from home? And I just said, okay, I right, definitely a demographic here. Yeah, I, you know, I think the, the reality is, right, we have a lot of statistics that kind of indicate there is a lot of work going on from Absolutely. home. And, you know, even in the early days where, you know, some institutions, you know, did a very uncomfortable thing and moved contact center agents <clears throat> to their home, you know, within the first quarter of doing that and getting them operationalized, um, a few of them told us that all of their, you know, customer metrics um, were up. You know, their NPS scores, customer satisfaction scores were up. It could very well be because it was also a challenging time uh, for the consumers. Um, but we know it's it's here to stay. And, and you know, I, there's various predictions of like, you know, is it going to be, you know, 15, wow. 20, 30, 40, even 60 percent, you know, of, a, of an institution's of employees that are working at home. And, you know, to a certain degree, I would say anything over 15 percent really doesn't you know, there shouldn't be a discussion about how many and what percentages. It's the fact that um, we need to be able to ensure, you know, as in the industry, that an employee that is working in a remote location, all right, is, can do it as efficiently um, as they can if they were inside the house from the perspective of having access to information and data and uh, collaboration with their peers, customer contact, uh, et cetera, right? So um, I was thinking about this because I think everyone knows the phrase, right? You know, with, with great power comes great responsibility. And I, I wondered like what the, what the origin of that was. So I looked it up because I, I wanted to, I, I didn't want to say, you know, we all saw that and remember that that's what Spider-Man's you know, uncle said. Um, and it turns out, right, that, that actually in the in the current nomenclature, that is what everybody remembers it from, right? And and I would say yeah, I brought that up only to say that um, you know, we as employees that have done this maybe more than other industries, right, understand the value to our 
you know, our work-life balance of working from home. Um, and you know, I think we've also seen, right, that there's an, as a tipping maybe over too much to working too much from home. Um, so I, I think it's a little bit more about, um, you know, the years going by where the environments that we work in need to get more sort of normalized so they potentially look like the ones we're in or we develop the technologies like the virtual backgrounds that, that WebEx has, you know, that allows us not to worry about the backgrounds we're in. But there is this element of employees also, you know, understanding that, you know, with with great power, with this great power that you have to work at home comes the great responsibility of, of that. And, you know, I think I think it, you know, it's a there would have been no way to get to where we are right, without having what happened happen. And so, um, you know, the silver lining out of this, if you will, right, is that. I think we we will work, you know, inside financial services industry and others, um, you know, toward um, an environment for all of us, you know, all employees that is, um, you know, uh, better meets the kind of lives that we want to live, right? You know, we 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 can't argue with the fact that, you know, especially in information-based industries, you know, we we have a tendency to, you know, to be working a lot. Right. So, so better work life balance. And we touched on that in the, I think the opening podcast, right? We talked a little bit about the nature of what's going on being somewhat of a, you know, democratizing factor, you know, across the board if we, if we, you know, focus correctly on it. You know, we heard for years that the, the branch was dying. That the branch was going to go away and, and it never did. It, it morphed, right? Customers' mm -hmm. expectations of what uh, transactions or what things they would do in the branch changed. And there were certain aspects of the solutions that branches and banks would offer that customers expected or even wanted to do in person. And, and I wonder as we're going through this and you have so much of the workforce working at home and so many things digitized, I wonder if we're starting to see or if, or if you guys have heard, are there things that the customers are now starting to lessen the desire to go into the branch? And are there things that they still adamantly want they're gonna to have to go into the branch for, they don't wanna do it digitally. Are we hearing yeah. any of that from the customers you're talking to? Well, probably the best person to ask is Heidi, because from a demographic perspective, right, in the future, right, this is it's true. This is yeah, we really, don't want to scare know, institutions. Question, really want to cater to. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. I think it's been an interesting uh, idea and an interesting trend that's happened because I know myself, a lot of my peers, I've always banked digitally. I've always used banks on my mobile application. I've gone pretty much virtual for most everything except for whatever I would consider a more significant transaction or a more significant um, to-do item, then I prefer to go into the branch. And I've seen that kind of consistent with a lot of my peers, even now. And I know, Danny, you said people had keep think the branch is dying. I think that if it was going to die, this past 12 months would have been kind of the nail in the coffin and it would, we really would have seen it go away. But they're still out there, they're reopening, they're coming back um, to an extent. And so I think we see that the branch isn't going anywhere. There's still that desire for whatever a customer considers a more significant transaction. So applying for a mortgage, talking to a financial advisor, some of these things you prefer to go in, I do personally. So I think the future of financial services for not just my demographic, but kind of across all consumers is that hybrid model. It's wanting to be able to pick and choose which interactions I want to do digitally and which interactions I'd feel more comfortable coming in. And I think a lot of that comes down to that security and that level of trust that you have. Um, and I know we talk about this a lot, that financial services, you really can't talk about it at all if you don't talk about security in some way, shape, or form, because these are your biggest assets a lot of times. It's also an area of a lot of insecurity for people where maybe you don't know a lot about where your money's at, how it's invested, what goes on behind the scenes, how is it staying secure? And so the consumers try to do everything they can to make themselves feel more comfortable. And so that's what the financial institutions or their banks are tasked with is making me or the average consumer feel comfortable doing all of my transactions virtually or doing them in the branch. Whichever way I wanna choose, it should be that same streamlined feeling of they've got me, I'm secure, all of my money's in the right place. Um, and I think that's what a lot of financial institutions are having to work towards is duplicating that same sense of familiarity and trust no matter which way or what hybrid model I decide to use. You know, on that hybrid front, Al and I have had this conversation uh, for the last few years, but 
it, you know, the banks used to be covered in a shroud. I used to call them like the Wizard of Oz, hiding behind the green curtain. Uh, and as things have gone hybrid, it's brought the consumer closer to the banks and to their processes and to their solutions. Uh, and so you can go in and, and when you leave, there's an expectation, I'm still going to be close to that. I'm still going to understand it more. And that curtain becomes uh, non-existent or, or, or opened, if you will. Uh, what what are we seeing from from everything that we discussed on this series and, and kind of as you said uh, expectation there Heidi what are we seeing that that is the next the next pin the next shoe to drop the next the next thing that they're going to look into I think what we've talked about a lot is just making that customer journey that hybrid model completely streamlined and consistent throughout so I think that's a piece that a lot of financial institutions are still working on and that is making sure that it's a continuous process. So the information that I'm inputting in my mobile application, as soon as I walk in the branch, they can recognize through my phone, through the intelligent Wi-Fi, okay, this is Heidi coming in, here's what we were just talking about, and then I'm just continuing the conversation. It's right in stride. It's not having to rehash anything. And so it's automating that process and making that customer journey so smooth and so complete that regardless of what order of operations I want to go, my journey and what's going on with Heidi's finances, follow me everywhere. And so I think that's the next element that financial institutions are working on. Um, and I know we've talked about it a lot with Al with doing virtual appointment scheduling, being able to do that on a mobile application. So that way you can go in through WebEx Teams, schedule an appointment, meet with your financial advisor right there on your mobile app. So whatever that looks like, it's just making that hybrid journey completely streamlined in no matter which direction or, or which way you decide to move forward. Yeah, and I would say, um... Actually, before I go on, could you guys hear my dog barking? No. Oh, sure okay. Did. Was barking. Sure. I don't know why. But got, you got, you got dark there, Gary. I know. Or I'm looking at the other feed. I can at least adjust that. So let me uh, let me go back to my comment here. Um, and, and I would say that uh, you know there's a lot of institutions that are down the road doing that, right? From a from the perspective of looking at at how to um, drive. Uh, engagement with their clients you know traditionally this is coming from the marketing organization who have tremendously become technology focused over the last five years right because they've got um, responsibility across all channels and rather than being reactively marketing right now um, you know we're moving into not only proactive but really now into predictive marketing that involves a lot of machine learning algorithms that involves you know, um, uh, AI to a certain extent. Um, the thing that, that is interesting there is that from a solution perspective, there are great solutions out there, but it's a complex world, right? And and so there's opportunities, I think, to consolidate that, that down. And I think, you know, one of the things is that um, a lot of that decisioning engine, um, you know, can probably wrap in a lot of the capabilities that are around it. And this is where, yeah, I think you've seen, you know, here in you know February 2021, where Cisco has just recently made acquisitions of IMI Mobile, um, and a previous acquisition in an experience management solution, uh, which we now call WebEx Experience Management. That the next iteration of that is really customer journey as a service, and the notion is that that everything is a discrete event, right? And those discrete events flow into a decisioning engine, and they come across. From all channels and I heard someone you know recently say it's not the concept maybe of omni-channel maybe it's the concept of no channels because to even think in a channel might be not the way to think it might be what did we see here what do we understand about what the customers preferences are and what do we want to do over here based on that preference and to be able to understand then how the customer reacted and be able to get those metrics out of that right to say was that a good interaction because um, the thing that's sort of um, you know great about the branch is that if you are doing some things from a you know let's say a, a campaign perspective, you're actually having somebody deliver that that message, and then if you're getting feedback from the person that delivered it, your staff, then you know what the customer said, right? And you may not know how it was delivered all the time, but you at least say they said no, and here's why. When you do that in the digital context, you may not know. Right. They, you don't know if someone opened the email, deleted it immediately, you know, read it, didn't like it, read it, liked it, but it wasn't right time. And so I think, you know, there's a whole element of where the customer journey is going 
that um, you know is going to require these this ability to, if you will, you know, understand these discrete events and map them with other intelligence, you know, to bring it together. And I did want to say one interesting stat when we're talking about branches because um, every every September the FDIC releases the branch stats for the previous year, and they're they're of June of that year. But between June 2019 and June 2020. Yes, we did lose in, in the U.S. maybe, I think, somewhere around 1,800 branches. But that negative 1,800 was because there were more branch openings in that year than there had been in previous years and more branch closings. So it's not, you know, this net decrease where we're, you know, we're just losing branches and they're disappearing. Uh, there's a lot more optimization, I think, going on. But there is a good amount of of building. And while the you know, the concentration of it, I think maybe around, I think, you know, um, 31%, right, of that was maybe from 25 institutions. But then, you know, the rest of those those branches that were open were from the rest of the industry. So, you know, I, I think the, the element of what is going to happen in the branches is going to continue to evolve. And uh, we'll still, I think, see a, you know, sort of continual decline, but we may end up ending in in some place in a few years where the kind of branch um, that institutions figure out is really valuable for the customers and you know more advisory focused more experience focused you know um, has them opening more you know we'll just have to see what what happens okay guys well uh, we are I don't know about you Gary but I'm almost done with my coffee and usually that signals well the end of our conversation so I guess I have one final question for you guys, and that is if you heard anything or had a realization while you were listening that you want our audience to know, um, and now is your opportunity. So not really a question, just an observation on your end. Uh, and then one last question after that, uh, and that is what's next? Um, I think our audience loves hearing from you guys, and so um, we would love to have you back on the podcast, and maybe you can enlighten us with what's on the horizon so that we can prep the viewers or listeners for that next podcast series. Absolutely. So th from my perspective, I think what was most interesting to hear about and, and just to see going on in the industry was financial services, like Gary said, being historically resistant to change, risk adverse. Um, I think a lot of this has been building for a really, really long time. And then what's happened in the past 12 months really just pushed the pedal down on the accelerator. And we just saw everything that's been working in the background suddenly coming to fruition. And as we said, I think that's gonna continue in the next three to five years to come. It's just continued rapid digitization, huge improvements being made in terms of the omni-channel experience, making that a hybrid customer journey. And so I personally am really excited to see how our technologies and our financial institutions are going to continue to grow and and be cutting edge and, and push forward as we're going forward in the next few years but i think this is just the tip of the iceberg and there's still a lot more transformation that's to come and i'm really excited to to see what's next how about you Al? yeah i i agree entirely um it's such an we're at such an early stage right i think of where we'll end up um, and there are many other topics I'm sure that we'll talk about, you know, as, as time moves forward um, and as financial services, you know, starts to get more embedded, um, you know, in everyone's digital lives. But um, I guess the thing that I think about now is that there's still a lot of uncertainty. And, you know, in, from, a, from the perspective of the recovery and there's good signs about it. I think, you know, um, we've, we realize now that the last 10 years of uh, you know, regulatory mandated um, capital reserves and in financial institutions is gonna really help us get through these kinds of environments. Um, and, you know, we gives us also the greater flexibility, you know, in when, when you have that kind of um, control, uh, I think to rebound faster, right? Because you're able to do things, you know, which I think the, the the financial service industry in the U.S. does real well, which is to basically say, if you're going to have losses, let's go ahead and say, you know, that's the provision for losses. We may have lost that, but let's move forward because we have the, the ability to do that. Um, but there's still uncertainty. And I think um, I heard a CIO the other day say that um, what we need to be comfortable with, right, is building our three to five year strategies with 
you know, 70% certainty maybe of what's going to happen, right? Um, that there's, there's still a lot of uncertainty there and that if our strategies, you know, need to change, are we flexible enough organizationally in our leadership, in our technology to change those, right? So I, I think um, that's really the, what I'm, you're hoping to see, right, is that this, this investment that's going on now and that's going to continue is going to create that capability for uh, for those institutions being more flexible because I think the thing we know is three months from now won't look like today. Six months from now will look different and, you know, normalization in an economic sense might not be till, you know, 2022, 2023, 2025, depending on where you are in the world, right? So, um you know, it's an exciting time, and I think we'll definitely make our way through it. Industry will make its way through it. I think it's already done a great, fantastic job. Credit to our financial service customers. Um, but that's, you know, that's the exciting part about this is we, we're here to help them on their journey um, and to work with them, you know, as they, uh, as they redefine what financial services is going to look like for everybody, right, in the coming years. Awesome. Well said, yeah, and Al, I think I think the redefining to me puts a wonderful bow around our five part series because everybody has everybody's dealing in currency. So it's not like we're talking about a bo a boutique shop mm -hmm. that only a certain percentage of people go to. This touches mm -hmm. everybody. And Danny, if you think about it, we've gone from, you know, remote worker to quantum computing and the implications of that in this series. So I, I, it's been a fascinating journey for me. Yeah, I, I, I agree as well. And, uh, and that's a great segue, Gary, into reminding our listeners that this is the close of a financial services series, a five-parter, and we will have links to the other four podcasts down below. So if you've missed any of those, please go back and listen to them. And for any more information on anything you've heard, uh, we will have a link down below to our cisco.com page where you can definitely read up uh, and get information on anything else you've heard. Uh, Heidi and Al, thank you both for your time on today's podcast. Uh, Al, you, as you said, you're becoming a recurring member of this uh, podcast series. And Heidi, we hope that uh, you will do the same as we move forward. Um, so thank you both. And uh, we'll talk to you guys next time. Great.